Whether it's a product for home or business, farm or factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Good evening to you. Good evening, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, collector of customs for the crown. We have word, Mr. Emery, that you have certain papers here covering a contraband cargo consigned to you within the last few days. My warehouse is at the foot of Long Wharf, Mr. Robinson. I conduct my business there. I conduct my business in whatever place I find it, Mr. Emery. What do you want? The manifest of the Brig Mary Ann, which docked at Salem two nights ago. I have been informed on excellent authority that her illegal cargo of molasses and rum was consigned directly to you. That's not true. It is true, Mr. Emery. Now, suppose you hand over the manifest and we'll cause no further unpleasantness. We can argue this matter tomorrow at my warehouse. We will argue this matter now, in your home. Either you will deliver up to me that manifest, or I will rip this place up. Part till I find it. Why, what right do you intrude yourselves into my home? By authority of the governor. He has no such authority. You can't come in here without a search warrant. I am in here. I demand to see your credentials. Ah, a stickler for detail. Show it to him. This is not a search warrant. No. It is a writ of assistance. It will do. It will not do. These writs have been outlawed in England for a hundred years. This is a thing, then, Mr. Emery. This is Boston. But by our charter, we're protected under English law. And by English law, these writs of assistance are void. Why, in every English court has declared them in violation of Magna Carta. This is no search warrant. It names no names. Nor does it specifically state the article to be searched for or the premise to be searched. You can't serve a thing like this. There's nothing there. Quite true. Nothing there. You will stop this illegal search this moment, Mr. Robinson. It's up to you to stop it, Mr. Emery. Hand me that manifest and we will leave at once. I haven't got it. Please, my good name. Oh. Excellent quality. Only a smuggler could afford them. No, John. <laughs> I 
tried and I've tried, tried and I've met with nothing but bullheaded. Don't excite yourself. If we're to win in this thing, we must have. I'll tell you your trouble, Sam Adams. Uh oh, friends, settle down. If Charles is to give an accounting of my failure, this is to be a long speech indeed. Not so long. One word will suffice. A large word. Not too large. Uh, the meanest words usually are the smallest. The word is impatient. Impatient? Well, I do plead guilty to the charge. Well, certainly things are wrong here in Boston, but give them time. These matters have a way of finding their own solution. It's always been my belief that the true solution is never one that's found, it's one that's earned. I am impatient to put an end to the deplorable, despicable existence that my lords of parliament seek to perpetuate in a land they have never seen nor will ever understand. Sam, you make it sound a lot worse than it really is. We're forbidden to trade with any other country but England. We can't manufacture a product that competes with British industry. We're proscribed from this end, we're banned from that end. Well, it all boils down to the point where a man must buy a custom stamp to kiss his wife. I still say you're too impatient. I am. I admit it. Liberty is a thing I hope to see happen. Hey, Sam. Sam, look at that. Writ of assistance. Was this served on you? They broke into my house less than an hour ago. Robinson oh. and his gang tore the place apart. China smashed. My personal papers examined and ripped to bits. Well, my patient friends, what do you think of this? If Robinson tried to serve a writ like this on me, I'd bash his head in with a barrel stave. Splendid. Let's all retire to the brewery and stock up with barrel staves. Trouble is, my friends, I'm afraid we'll give out of barrel staves before the governor gives out of writs. Come along with me, John. Where to? We'll pay a visit to James Otis. Otis? What do we want with him? Words. I don't trust him. He's a man bought by a question borne by the governor. I don't think the mints of the world have yet turned out enough coin to buy James Otis. Come along with me, John. <laughs> Stand back. Let me see how you look. James, I think your daughter's prettily enough gowned for the governor's party tomorrow. Oh, very prettily. Don't you think the bodice is cut a trifle low? Oh, Father. Remember, Elizabeth, it is mystery that captures the interests of a man. Perhaps, but it's the evidence that holds him. Elizabeth. Who is it you're so desirous of calling? Hey, Brown. Ah. Oh, it's good looking and charming, gentle and heir to a title and one of the richest estates in Lancashire. And a lobster bat. Don't you call him that. He is so. He's a lobster bat. Very. A lobster bat. Well, it comes to life to him, we have to pay heavy taxes, and our ships can't trade with the Indies. And, and taxation without representation is tyranny, and don't tell me it isn't so, because Aunt Mercy says it is. Mary. Aunt Mercy. Everything she hears from Aunt Mercy, she repeats like a parrot. Aunt Mercy is a patron. All right, Mary, that's enough. There's enough discord and dissidence in the streets of Boston. We don't have to track it into our home. I've warned you, James, time and again. Mary's infatuation for your sister will bring us nothing but embarrassment and grief. How do you think it looks to have your daughter, the daughter of the Advocate General of the province, marching about town ahead, stuffed full of these wild, rebellious ideas? What would you have me do, Ruth? Well, speak to your sister. <laughs> my sister's opinions, like the movements of the heavenly bodies, are things beyond my power to control. You could forbid Mary to see her. I will see you still. You're all afraid. I'm afraid to see the truth. I'm afraid to admit that his high and mighty, the governor, is nothing but a pirate. A tyrant. Oh, Can't even... Oh. oh, Sam Adams. Good evening, James. I hope we're not disturbing ah, you. Not at all. Come in. How are you, John? Passably well. Ruth, you remember John Emery? Uh, Emery. My daughter's, sir. Uh, Sam, of course. course. Good evening, Adam. Ruth. Come along, Elizabeth. I'm very tired. We have intruded, James. Oh, nonsense. Nonsense. Well, our business is urgent. Well, uh, Come into my study. Mary, will you fetch up some wine? Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, how can I serve you? You can call out your dogs. My dog? Robinson and that gang of thugs he calls his deputies. Oh, what has happened? They practically tore John's house apart this evening. Well, did they have a search warrant? Search warrant? Don't be ridiculous. Nothing but a writ of assistance. Uh, who issued this writ? The governor? Not in person. He left that job to Mr. Hutchinson. I see. Breaking into a man's house, insulting his family. 
And you should have seen your friend Robinson smirking and sneering as though he were ants he could trample on. Robinson is no friend of mine. Oh. I, I know that, James. Thank you. But you are in a position to help us. Oh. How? No, two ways. First, use your influence with Governor Bernard to call in these vicious writs. And if he will not, then the second. Join with us in our fight to have these writs voided in court. Well, as Advocate General said, my duty would be to defend the writs, not oppose them. Oh, you'll never do that. I have no choice. God help the man who has no choice. That's not a fair thing to say, Sam. There's such a thing as the obligations of public office. Well, there is such a thing as the obligation to one's own conscience, too, James. How does your heart lie? With Bernard and Robinson and the viciousness of the administration, or is it with the people of Boston, your own kind? And it doesn't invariably follow that my own kind is always right. I'm not sure they're right in this case. There is a law that prevents the colonies trading directly with the Spice Islands of the West Indies. It's a bad law, I'll admit, but still a law. Now, the merchants seek to subvert the law by subterfuge, smuggling. But Art seeks to uphold it for the use of force and illegal writs. I say both sides are in error. Except for this. The merchants are protecting their property, their homes. Bernard is protecting nothing except his own pocketbook and the selfish interests of milords of England. Now, this is a time for taking sides, James. None of us are about this fight. We're all in it up to our armpits. We're in it. You're in it. I will speak to the government. Is that all? Isn't that what you want? Will you help us rid ourselves of these writs? I can't promise that. Not now. Well, we won't take up any more of your time, James. We on our way, John. Mary, will you show the gentleman out? Yes, Father. Sam, I will do what I can. Splendid. Good night, James. Sam. Good evening. Good evening. Well, she's as pretty as a mother. Peter, are you certain my brother was coming directly here from the governor's? Mr. Otis said you would come directly here. Yes, Miss Mercy. <laughs> You've been with us a long time, Peter, haven't you? Yes, I have, Miss Mercy. Thirty-eight years with your father, the judge. And now six years with young Master James. And during all that time, at the end of the day, there is always a perfect balance. Why, I should hope so. Peter, wouldn't it be wonderful if one day your figure should refuse to balance? If they were suddenly taken with a spirit of independence, a defiance against the discipline, the tyranny of mathematics. Suppose they should suddenly marshal all their numbers and in stout columns march off the page of your ledger, shouting out their defiance, proclaiming their independence to add up to whatsoever sum fitted their arithmetic pleasure. What would you think of that? I think it would make it most difficult to conduct a commercial enterprise. Possibly. But it would be wonderful balm to the dignity of a digit. <laughs> Didn't bring the matter up. Oh. The time didn't seem propitious. Oh. Besides, I don't think it will do any good. The governor's determined to uphold the Navigation Act, and he will use these writs as he pleases. The merchants will fight this, James. Oh, I suppose they will. Well, who will we get to take the case up in court? I don't know. There are many competent lawyers in Boston. Sir. Competent enough to stand up against Bernard Hutchinson and company. Well, you'll find them out. We have found him. You. Say, there is no one else, James, just you. Now, good day. You are the only one, James. Oh, mercy. What are you doing here? The one and only man. What are you talking about, Mercy? Well, you've got to do it. You've got to stand up and fight the things that are happening in this town. You've got to take the side of the merchant. Why should I? Because Why should I take the side of the merchant? Because it's the side you were born to. James, can't you see what's happening? What do you think is happening, Mercy? The most irresistible force in the world. Change. The people are emerging, coming out of the dark into the open, finding they like the smell of liberty. England refuses to believe that. They're trying to hold on to today with the dead ideas of yesterday. They refuse to believe America's coming of age, trying to rock a grown man in the cradle of an infant. There are factors in this beyond the emotional, Mercy, beyond even the patriotic. What factors? The future of my career, the well-being of my family. 
So, you're balancing your books too, is that? I don't know what you mean, Mercy. If you don't know what I mean, James, then I'm wasting my time. about a few shillings tax. Seems a bit ungrateful to me, considering all England's done to save the colonies from the French and Indians. Why the complaints? Why the complaints? I will tell you why, Lieutenant. It is Boston, the nature of the place. And what is Boston? Boston is a town founded on complaint and perpetuated by a race of lawyers who were born with a petition in one hand and a writ in the other. <laughs> <laughs> on Judgment Day, I'm sure that the hand of the Lord will be stayed by some infernal litigation still pending in the courts of Boston. Mr. Hutchinson. Your Excellency, my deepest regrets. I just see where have you been? You missed an excellent dinner. Oh, that I am sure, sir. With your permission. I wonder if I might have a word in private with Your Excellency for a moment? What? Tear myself away from this congenial company? I should say not. <laughs> Come, sir, speak your speech. I'm sure that no vital state secrets are involved. As you wish. Madam. I had occasion to stop by the British Coffee House this afternoon and I, uh, I overheard a conversation that was so intriguing it kept me sitting there much longer than I'd anticipated. Sir, it seems the merchants of Boston are combining into a conspiracy against Your Excellency. They're always conspiring against me. <laughs> what is it this time? They're going to take legal action in court to prevent any further use of the writs of assistance. Legal action? Go to court? Yes, precisely. Go to your court, Hutchinson. Yes. Go to your court and ask you to declare my writs illegal. Yes. <laughs> Very comical. <laughs> what is not so comical is the fact they've already selected the man to lead their fight in court. So, and who made that be? Uh, Sam Adams? No, uh, not Adams. Mr. Otis. Perhaps you could help us with a little man. What is it, Mr. Hutchinson? Mr. Otis, it is very disturbing to hear talk in a public place that our uh, distinguished Advocate General purposes to go to court not to defend an action of our governor, but to uh, challenge it. What's this? Mere gossip, Mr. Otis. Oh, I hardly think this is the time or the place to discuss this matter. Oh, His Excellency thinks it is the time. And the most congenial place to discuss it. Is it, uh, is it true, Mr. Otis? Well, Otis? It is quite true that I have been approached by a group of citizens who have asked me to consider the matter. What did you tell them? I told them I would consider it. Consider it? I also promised them I would discuss the problem with Your Excellency and I hope you may see your way clear to discontinue the issuance of these writs. How dare you even suggest that I would listen to you? Well, they will cause nothing but mischief, Your Excellency, James, my dear. In the face of them, no home is safe from intrusion by any subordinate in the Customs House. This violates one of the fundamental freedoms guaranteed every citizen under English law. You are my Advocate General, sir, and you will defend these writs in court. I say this. I order you to defend them. You order? I do. You overestimate your position, oh, sir. Oh, dis- There is nothing in your commission that gives you the authority to order me to defend an illegal act. You are my Advocate General, sir. I am not your Advocate General. I give your back your precious post. James! always fascinated me. Since I was a child, it comes from the heavens like the revelation of truth, suddenly and with fire. You know, Mary, I'll tell you something. What is it, Father? I've always had a curious feeling that when God Almighty and his providence should take me from time into eternity, it should be by a bolt of lightning. Don't say that. Why not? Now that you've 
seen part one of A Bolt of Lightning. Let's turn to our Westinghouse program and Betty Furness. Don't buy till you see these. Hmm, wonder what they are. These are instruction books for different makes of refrigerators. Usually you don't get to see these books until the refrigerator is delivered to your door. But believe me, you'd save yourself a lot of confusion and really know what you're buying if you'd read that book carefully before you buy. For instance, what does it mean to you when a refrigerator claims in its advertising that there's no defrosting? Well, I know of three different refrigerators that make this claim, and yet the instruction book on the first one says, frost does build up on the freezer. And in preparing to defrost it, the book advises you to remove the frozen foods. Now, is that your idea of no defrosting? The second book advises you, when the frost gets thick, to scrape it off, like that. Now, that isn't my idea of no defrosting. And the third book frankly says that you can speed up defrosting by placing a pan of hot water in the freezer. <laughs> Obviously, these refrigerators don't mean the same thing that Westinghouse means when it says no defrosting. Here is the Westinghouse Care and Use Book. And it says the Westinghouse Frost-Free Refrigerator completely eliminates the disagreeable task of defrosting. Now, that means that you never have to take your frozen foods out of here because the frost-free defrosts itself so quickly that the frozen foods stay safely, steadily frozen all the time. And, of course, you don't have to scrape the frost off here because it never gives the frost a chance to build up. And as for putting pans of hot water in here, well, of course, you never have to do that because the frost-free refrigerator is completely automatic. As the Westinghouse Care and Use Book says uh, right here, there is nothing for you to do and nothing for you to touch. And that's what Westinghouse means by no defrosting. So, if you want the only refrigerator that never needs any kind of defrosting, just look for this magic counter button. It's the sign of the frost-free system. Yes, when you own a Westinghouse frost-free refrigerator, your defrosting chores are gone forever. And I don't mean one chore or two chores or three, but I mean every single defrosting chore. So only, only, truly, completely automatic refrigerator. Remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Now let's return to Westinghouse Studio One and a bolt of lightning. What do you think, Sam? I think it's fine. No, do you I think I've made my point strongly enough? Oh, yes, yes. It's a good speech, like good wine. Requires a touch of mildness, otherwise they both have the tendency to make one seek the solace of the nearest couch. <laughs> and if one must go to sleep, the liquid route is preferable to the verbal one. Oh, Ruth, you must see the latest draft here of Danger Speech. It's really the finest, I think. Ruth. Am I your very special villain, Ruth? Some cold meat on the tray and some milk. Thank you. You haven't eaten all day. Ruth, we've been friends, and very good friends, too, for a long time. Losing that friendship would be a very heartbreaking thing for me. I don't think you have a heart, Sam. I think you're selfish, I think you're dangerous, I think you're mad. Ruth, sir. No, 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 let, let us say it, James. I think what you've done to James in the past few months is despicable. What have I done? What have you done? You've destroyed him. Boo. You have destroyed him. His career is as good as ended. But there isn't a respectable client in Boston who'd retain him again. We've managed so far, Ruth. Managed to dig our way deeper and deeper into debt. Where will we end, James? In a rookery down by Long Wharf. I live by the docks and I like it. Then stay by the docks with the scum and rabble of the waterfront. Why do you intrude yourself among decent people of Boston? People who want nothing but peace. Why? Only the... Poor people want peace, too. But there's something else they want. Do you know what it is? Trouble. No, that's not what they want. That's what they acquire. But there is something that they want deeply, passionately. I think the good folk of Back Bay want the same thing. It's a very simple thing. They want the freedom to have a lock on the door of their homes. Oh, that's ridiculous. No, no, it isn't, Ruth. 
Sam's put his finger in the very heart of the matter. That's why I fight to bar my door against intrusion, whether by a footpad or a constable. The right to the honorable estate of privacy, the right to have a door to my home, and the right to lock that door. I can't argue with you, James. I haven't the will. All I know is that a very few months ago you were respected by every family in the community. Now, look at us now. Elizabeth is running off to Nova Scotia so she can marry Lieutenant Brown and raise a family far from the disgrace of her father. Boston is no place for her. It's no place for me either. Elizabeth wants me to go with her. And will you go? I would love it dearly. Sorry, James. Elizabeth is overwrought. I apologize well, for her. We're all overwrought and tired. It's a great deal of work to put into a hopeless cause. A hopeless cause, James? Yes. No matter what I say or how I say it, Hutchinson will never dare to declare these writs illegal. I hope you're right, James. I hope I'm... Don't you want to win this case? No. I want Hutchinson to declare them legal. I want Bernard to keep issuing them. I want the collectors of custom to execute them. I want villainy to be compounded on Billy and Jill to the people cry out in fury. I don't want to win a skirmish, James. I want to win a war. War? You've used that word before, Sam. I don't like it. I'm a loyal British subject. The idea of war against Britain is revolting to me. It's treasonable. I insist our grievances can be settled and must be settled within the framework of English law. You know law, James, but I know people. And when one group, nation, race, or any combination of humans sets out to impose its will on another to enslave and deprave them, then look to the barricades and not the law courts for relief. When defense of liberty becomes treason, then surely treason is defensible. More, it's desirable. But in this matter, I'm not the rebel, no. Nor can you accuse me of treason. Bernard, Hutchinson, the Lords of Parliament, the ministers of the King, look to them if you look for treason, James. Well, by their very act, they subvert, they twist, deny, destroy the guarantees of liberty which are the very blood of English law, and that is true treason. That is sedition in its most naked sense. I'll see you in court tomorrow, James. Fine. And I hope to win. Yes. A hopeless cause? Yes, sir. Well, I've only one other thing to say to you, James. What is that, sir? Stand firm. Against all the forces that will try to drain from you your will to struggle, you stand firm. Well, Mistress Mary, where do you think you're going? I'm walking in my sleep. Well, then walk right back around and up to your own room. Well, can I come down for just a minute? No. Half a minute? No. I'm a rebel. I don't dare. Ah, <laughs> you're a vexer. I'm just awful. Terrible. Is it finished? What? The speech you're going to make in court tomorrow. And can I come? Aunt Mercy says she'll take me. Yes, on both counts. Oh, wonder. Can I hear it? No. Please. Oh, Mary. I won't go to sleep without. I swear I won't. Well, just a bit then. I'll be happy. citizens of this town. I was solicited to argue this cause as Advocate General because I would not. I have been charged by some with desertion from office. To this charge I give a very sufficient answer. I renounce that office. I argue against these writs, not for them, because I will to my dying day oppose with all the powers and faculties God has given me. All such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other, which these writs of assistance most surely are. Here, here. Order in the court. Order in the court. Order in the court. Order in the court. Let it be known that I shall not again tolerate any such disturbance from the galleries. <laughs> Continue, sir. One of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. A man's house is his castle, and whilst he is quiet, 
He is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. These writs of assistance, if declared legal, will totally annihilate this sacred human right. <laughs> With these writs, customs house officers may enter our houses as they please. We are commanded to permit their entry. Their menial servants may enter. They break locks, bars, everything in their way. And whether they break through malice or revenge, no man, no court can inquire. There is a law written in men's hearts before parliaments were dreamed of. A man's right to his home is derived from nature and the author of nature and is inherent inalienable and indefeasible by any laws, pacts, contracts, covenants, or stipulations which man can devise. In his house, man is an independent sovereign. The club he snaps from a tree, or a staff, or for defense, is his own. His bow and arrow is his own. If by a pebble he has killed a partridge or a squirrel, it is his own. Right. The right to property. To maintain and defend that property is beyond question and beyond the means of any officer of government to deny. Most honored sir, the security of life, liberty, and property, which surely includes one's dwelling, has been the object of all struggles against arbitrary power, civil or political, temporal or spiritual, military or ecclesiastical, in every age. Listen to me, sir, and hear this. If the king of Great Britain in person were encamped on Boston Common at the head of 20,000 men, with all his navy on our coast, he would still be unable to execute these writs. The people, sir, they will resist. They will resist! <laughs> That's the easiest thing to do. Cheers and applause. Good payment for actors and fools. But, Mama, everyone in Boston's talking about Father. Yes, that's right, talking about him. Saying he sold himself to the devil. No one says that. That's what the decent people say. The decent people? You mean the snobs. At Mercy said that, that would be enough, Mary. Go to your rooms. But, Mother, I do as I say. You should be proud. <laughs> Both of you. Proud? Proud of what? Proud of the cheers of the mob? Well, we'll make a neat package of those cheers and offer them to the greengrocer. What will they buy? Flour? Corn? Tea? When you're hungry, Mary, try the taste of cheers. <laughs> you bungled it. You, you failed me completely. Well, I, I really don't think that's being quite fair of Your Excellency. I don't get, give anything whether you, you think or don't think. You bungled it. You allowed Hutchison to get up, uh, Otis to get up, and to perform in front of a court as I've never seen anyone behave in a court before. Well, what do you want me to do? Shut him up! I tried, but I couldn't. Obviously. Well, I can see that I'll have to uh, undertake this little thing by myself. Um, I'm sorry. Let me go. But, uh, do you hear? Go at once. Mr. Robin, uh, you were in court this morning, weren't you? Yes, I, I was there, Your Excellency. And uh, how did Mr. Otis's performance strike you? Uh, he's got a silver tongue, no taking that away. No, but I understand that he took the trouble to make some very pointed remarks about your behavior as my collector of customs. He did that. I would like to ask you one thing, Mr. Robinson. Do you find these writs at all... Uh, Will uh, talk helpful in the pursuit of your duties? Why, it's a piece of paper I can shove under their noses. Not that I couldn't be just as persuasive without it, if you know what I mean, Your Excellency. Yes, I understand. My boys, that is, uh, my deputies, they know how to do their work. And so I've been told, and with enthusiasm. Well, being loyal officers of the king, sometimes they do let their sense of duty get the best of their... Naturally gentle dispositions? Yes. Well, I, um, I have a little favor to ask of you, Mr. Robinson. There is a faction in this town that's causing me a great deal of annoyance. 
Yes, they're upsetting the usual placid nature of this colony, and we, all of us, wish to maintain peace and quiet. Hmm, by all means, peace and quiet. James Otis, Sir Sam Adams, John Hancock. Troublemakers, all of them. I know what I'd do if I had a free hand. Oh, I'm quite satisfied on that score, Mr. Robinson. Of course, in your official capacity, there isn't much you can do. Uh, that's the sad truth. But as an individual, as a free man who has been up to put up to public ridicule, as uh, no doubt this morning you were by Otis, well, I should think... Uh, Is this the favor you're asking of me, Your Excellency? Oh, I'm asking nothing specifically. But if Mr. Otis could be shown the error of his ways, if an example could be set, uh, if others of his rebellious brethren would uh, be shown what happens when one defies or attempts to destroy the king's law. I understand. You do. Perfectly. Good. I think you will find this rather a profitable little, uh, little undertaking, Mr. Robinson. Well, I was never known to turn my back on a little honest profit. I shouldn't think so. Uh, might I? We do. Great work. Last night, it's too bad they don't have words. You're an inspiration. Well, James, you're the man of the hour. This time tomorrow, the Sons of Liberty will be distributing copies of your speech in every corner of the country. Charleston, Richmond, Philadelphia, New York. I can hear them take up the cry. The people, sir, they will resist become a rallying call. It will sweep across the country with the fire of a lightning bolt. I must go, Sam. Oh, no, stay. No, I have to go home. Why? Elizabeth is leaving on the night packet for Nova Scotia. Oh, and Ruth is going with her. I'm sorry, James. I had my fair warning. She gave me my choice this morning before I went to court. Throw up the case, she would remain in Boston. Go on with it, she would leave with Elizabeth. I mean it, James. I know Ruth. <laughs> Not quite as well as I do. She meant it. Nothing will change her. Ruth is kind, understanding, unselfish, but she has more than a fair share of pride. This thing has cut us apart. All that we had is broken. Well, Cousin Sam. Uh, John, I don't believe you've met my esteemed relative, James. This is John Adams of Braintree. John, this is James Otis. It was meeting you, sir. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Otis. I was in the courtroom today. I heard your magnificent speech. It was a speech that breathed into this nation the very breath of life. Well, it's nice of you to say so. Robinson, what the devil does he want here? I've been looking for you, Otis. Have you? I've got something to say. Well, say it then. You're a sneaking, lying, contemptible rebel, Otis. A liar and a slanderer. I've slandered no one. You slandered me and my men. Good, loyal officers of the king. You said they broke locks. All this menial servant. Well, I'll not let you get away with that. I have no wish to enter into a public brawl with you, Robinson. I'm not interested in your wishes, Mr. Otis. I'm calling you a lying, contemptible troublemaker. And it's time you learnt your lesson. And the rest of you that are huddled around here, wanting treason, it's time you learnt your lesson, too. You're the slick tongue, Mr. Otis. Maybe this will help you to keep it quiet. Oh, stop them! Don't let them get away! Never mind them, John. Get a doctor. Quickly. Quickly. Mary, Mary, you should go to bed. No. Go to your room. I won't. You can't expect the child to leave while the doctor is still in with James. It's very late, Mary. There's no point sticking around here. I'll come and tell you what the doctor says as soon as he comes out. Mother, please. Oh, let us stay, Ruth. Mercy, listen to me. I want you to get out. Ruth, get out and stay out forever. What's that Mercy done? She hasn't Be done quiet, anything. Be quiet, Mary. If your mother desires me to leave... Of course, I shall. I'll pray for him. How badly is he hurt, Doctor? The surface wound doesn't seem to be very serious, but I'm afraid he's suffered considerable discomfort to the brain. He will get well. These things are unpredictable, Mrs. Otis. You'll need constant care for a long time. And quiet. 
I think it would be best now if you were all to leave. Anything you want or, or need, Ruth, whatever I can do. You've done quite enough as it is, Sam. and look at our Westinghouse program again. Thanksgiving, a holiday. Well, it certainly doesn't look like a holiday for Mother. It sure doesn't, the poor dear. Mom has to keep that turkey company, watching it like a hawk. There she goes to baste it again so it won't turn out dry. But there wouldn't be any basting or any worrying or any work at all to roasting a turkey if she had this completely automatic Westinghouse electric roaster oven. Let me show you how easy it is to roast a turkey in this Westinghouse roaster. First, you pick up that nice fat bird and set it into the roaster like that. And there's plenty of room. See? Then, you put on the self-basting lid with the look-in cover. Then, you set the true temp dial to 300 degrees. Then, you stay out of the kitchen and leave that turkey alone. Your Westinghouse will roast it to perfection, baste it automatically, and turn it out so tender and juicy that you'll say, why, there just never was such a turkey. Oh, my goodness, I almost forgot. Here are the whipped potatoes for Thanksgiving dinner. Don't they look just perfect? That's what this handsome Westinghouse food crafter does. It mashes them, and then it whips them until they turn out fluffy and creamy like that. And this wonderful food crafter also mixes cake batter. It grinds meat and vegetables. It juices oranges. It does just dozens of other things. So, well, why not give Mother something extra to be thankful for on Thanksgiving Day? She'll love this new food crafter, and she'll love the Westinghouse electric roaster oven, because they'll do her work for her not only on Thanksgiving, but most every day. Remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. We return now to Westinghouse Studio One. And a bolt of lightning. You'll be able to get smuggled by the red coat picket? Well, I have no trouble getting it by this time. All papers? Manure. And fresh and tangy it'll be. A wagon load. And I don't think the pickets will be too particular about prodding through it. Oh, that's dandy. In war, my lad. It's called strategy. I'll be off with you. Aye, which way will the wagon be headed to? Straight for Bunker Hill. William Woolley, have you lost all your sense of manners? You might at least off your cap to an old acquaintance. Sorry, ma'am. Don't mumble. Sorry, ma'am. That's better. Why aren't you with the troops? Well, ma'am. Speak up. What? Well, ma'am. What are you doing in Boston? If you must know, I'm here to do a bit of spying. Spying? What do you men know of spying? Why, one woman behind a lace curtain can find out more in an hour than a dozen men could in a week of snooping. Now, what is it you want to know? Well, ma'am. Speak up, William. I'm a trifle deaf. You know that. Colonel Prescott. 
There's hankering to know the disposition of the British troops. Oh, that. General Gage has four regiments camped on the common. This morning he moved the first Highlanders in the Royal Dragoon up Common Street to Lynn. General Howe has 3,000 troops aboard the fleet, and they'll be landing tomorrow morning at Charlestown Dock. Is that what you want to know? Yes, sir. Now, about the fleet. The main section is anchored off Royal Battery, but two men of war and three sloops are at Hudson Point. Yes, sir. Now get you back to Colonel Prescott and tell him Mercy Warren says for him not to waste his soldiers on snooping. Leave that to the women. We're practiced hands at the yard. Yes, sir. Goodbye. <laughs> Mary, my darling, come in, please. Is your mother at home? Tell her I'm here. Margaret, Aunt Mercy's here. Come in, Mercy. Nothing's changed. Not in seven years. Only people change. Brocade and woodwork are beyond the reach of time. Sit down. I can't offer you tea. We have none. But there's not a pound of tea in Boston, except the British commissary in the governor's house. Gage hopes by this blockade to force us into submission. Actually, these little pinches are just what we need to keep us awake and angry. I'm sorry, Ruth. I forgot you don't feel as we do. I have an island here, Mercy. An island of solitude I've built for myself. I've put up a barricade of silence. I know nothing of what goes on outside that door. My husband once told me that he fought to maintain the highest state of privacy. I see to it that this battle, at least, he's won. How is James? How is James? Father's mind is almost completely gone, Aunt Mercy. Well, up until a little time ago, he seemed almost to be getting well. He'd be fine for days. Write letters to Franklin, to Patrick Henry. He even planned to attend the General Assembly. But then the shadow came down again. And now he just sits there by his window, never moving, never saying a word. Ruth, you must take him away from here. Take him away? There's plenty of room in the house at Barnstable. Well, why should we go there? They'll soon be fighting in Boston. It won't be safe. He may be hurt. Possibly. But he's beyond further hurt, Mercy. Don't you understand that? He lives in a world where nothing exists. Not even pain. Well, then think of yourself and Mary. Mary can go, of course, if she likes. I shall stay here. I like my little island, Mercy. And for the little longer that matters, I'll stay upon it. Ruth, may I come again? Of course. Come often, if you like. I frighten you. It's so late. I was listening to the storm. Thunder. Is it my storm, Mary? Your storm? Is there lightning? It's not a storm, Father. What is it? A battle. A battle where? Bunker Hill, just beyond Charleston. The British are bombarding the American line. Are they not fighting? How many? I don't know. Where are they from? From all over. The minute men have gathered from all New England. They do resist. The people, they do resist. James, where are you going? 
It's a bunker here. But you can't go out. Why not? But it's late and dangerous and you're sick. No man is ever so sick that he cannot rise up and fight for his people. Reckon they'll be coming back again. How many rounds you got left? Seven. I got five. Well, I'll make an even dozen redcoats of bear bags. And then what? Well, a musket's got two ends, and I'd just as soon dash them as bang them. William, eh? Come take a look at this. Look at what? Do you ken the old stir at the breastwork yonder? That one? Aye, is there no familiarity about him? No. Likely he's a New Hampshire man. Well, uh, there's something about him. If a man can be sure of anything, I'm sure of this. Sure of what? That's James Otis. Otis? It can't be him. Just said his mind's completely gone and that he acts like a child now. It's him, the old man. He's right here with us. I guess you'd be creeped. Like I was seeing a ghost. The ghosts are abroad this day, thanks to the prophets. They're carrying muskets. Look to the work at hand, Tom. Which one do you want? The one on the left. Second in line. I like a plump the fifth in line for me. Up the limit, Fighting stopped. Just begun. A man passing by told me that our men fought wonderfully well. Three times the British tried to take our position, three times they failed. Only when our ammunition was spent did our lines retreat. Did he say nothing of your father? Had he seen him? He saw nothing of father. Is he dead on that hill, Mary? No. If he were, it would be an end to his torment. It would be good. Mother. It would be good. I want it. God help me. I want it. I pray for it. Fine beginning, Mary. Fine first page. And now from every town and farm, from every spire and steeple, there rose the voices of free men, the spirit of the people. Guard your homes, old freeborn men, you're not slave or a vassal. Mind the words James Otis said, a man's home is his castle. Pad, September 1783. Latest intelligence from the French capital reports that the peace negotiations are proceeding at an urgent pace. It is expected that a treaty of peace will be signed at any moment, granting full and complete independence to the former British colonies in America. Leave the windows open, Mary. It's starting to rain. I know. I've been watching the storm gather its force. The clouds hunching up in the horizon like sails, fat with wind. The lightning in the distance coming closer. Hey, do you remember what I said to you once long ago about the lightning? Yes. It made me shiver. Why should it make you shiver? What is lightning with a bond of fire binding heaven to earth? It always frightens me. It should. If the rain should come in, would you close the shutters? Oh. I will. Be sure. I promise. Freedom is sure 
when a man is secure in his castle of liberty. This is Paul Brinson. We'd like you to meet Mr. Thomas E. G. Paradigm, National Vice Commander of the American Legion, and Mr. John H. Ashbaugh, Vice President of Westinghouse. Mr. Ashbaugh, this month, November, is Americanism Appreciation Month. The American Legion and its auxiliary are doubling their efforts to remind us that the American way is the good way, and that each one of us has a personal responsibility to see that we keep it that way. I think that tonight's Studio One show of the story of James Otis has made many of us pause to reconsider the blessings of freedom that we enjoy. And so I would like to say on behalf of the Americanism Commission of the American Legion that we salute Westinghouse for this and for the many other splendid examples of Americanism you've given us. Thank you, Commander Paradine. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Westinghouse, we appreciate this tribute by your three million American Legionnaires. And I assure you that we will always support the American way of life. Our sincere thanks to you, your legion. <clears throat> Here's Betty Furness to talk about a kitchen miracle. Well, this is just an ordinary head of cabbage, but believe it or not, you can now cook this cabbage without smelling up your kitchen. Your guests won't even know you had cabbage for dinner. And the same thing is true of fish or cauliflower, anything else you cook. And here's the secret. It's this wonderful new little bulb that Westinghouse has developed. It's called the Odor Out, and it's another Westinghouse first. This Westinghouse Odor Out bulb destroys unpleasant odor. Now, I don't mean that it substitutes a pleasing odor for an unpleasing one. It gets rid of the odor. This fixture back here has an odor out bulb in it. Now, you just plug it in like that, and it produces odor-destroying ozone from the natural oxygen in the air and makes the air as fresh and sweet as all outdoors. Best of all, it's cleaner and cheaper to use than chemical preparations. This is just another example of how the genius of Westinghouse research has found new ways to make life pleasanter for all of us. Another one of the thousands of reasons why we say you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. This is Paul Branson saying goodnight, Paul Westinghouse. Makers of more than 40 million products.